It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Crosby from the Department of Horticulture at Texas A&M University. Um, Dr. Kevin Crosby's area of research is plant breeding and genetics of melon, pepper, tomato, onion, and carrots. The main emphasis of his research has been uh, the elucidation of genetic mechanisms for stress tolerance and enhanced nutritional quality. Dr. Crosby received his uh, bachelor's in horticulture from Texas A&M, his master's in horticulture and plant breeding from the University of Hawaii, and his PhD in plant breeding at Texas A&M. The title of his presentation today is Developing Vegetables with Enhanced Levels of uh, Beneficial Phytochemicals. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Crosby. First off, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to the organizing committee for inviting me here. Um, it's my pleasure to talk today. You'll, the talk will be, I have to confess, a little Texas-centric. I, I was a little trepidatious about what to talk about, so I just thought back on my mentor, Dr. Pike. Just, you know, talk about the, stick to the facts and talk about, you know, what you're doing to impact your local region. But nonetheless, I think a lot of what I'll talk about is uh, translational to many regions because the crops that we're talking about, of course, are very important outside of Texas. Um, one thing, other thing I'll mention is as a master's student in Hawaii, um, uh, Jim Brubaker served on my committee. So uh, if you were wondering if I was certified, I think that that uh, kind of certifies me as a genuine plant breeder because he was uh, he was a really uh, a great man. He is a great man, and he was a very good uh, 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 mentor, and he gave me some great ideas. Really made me think about quantitative genetics more than I had before. So the other thing I want to do is give credit where credit is due. Um, uh, I don't have Bimu's picture on here, but you saw Bimu. Of course, he's also very important in my research. And this is a lesson for all you graduate students that are going to be plant breeders someday. I'll just say one word, phenotyping. Everything else you do is meaningless without good phenotypic data. And these are people that helped me and have helped me dramatically, along with Dr. Patil, along with many pathologists uh, who I don't show here because this talk is more focused on nutritional value. Um, these are colleagues that I have at uh, AgriLife Research Centers, and Kilson was here many years at the Vegetable and Fruit Improvement Center. So they really helped me to gather important data, not just phytochemical, but the environmental data, their physiologists, uh, multi-location data that is necessary to be able to study these different, uh, these different attributes. The good news is, as Erwin stressed, that there is a strong correlation between what we eat in the realm of fruits and vegetables and plant products and reduced incidence of disease. There's a lot of, of information, uh, epidemiological information, to indicate this. Um, and there are a lot of key phytochemicals in plant products, vegetables and fruits, that we don't get uh, in other parts of our diet and that we do not synthesize. Now, uh, some people say that we like to do things big in Texas. Now, as a breeder, of course, we would like to take credit for something like this. This was where somebody spilled the nitrogen. But it's the same cultivar of spinach. We do have a new spinach breeder, uh, Carlos Avila, and I would like to uh, say kudos to him for working on this very important crop. This is the only thing I'm going to mention about spinach, but it is a very important deliver, delivery system for phytochemicals such as lutein and carotenoids. And it's good to see how much that industry has grown in the United States and the consumption of fresh spinach. So vegetable breeding at Tamu goes back even prior to the Leonard Pike era uh, for more than 70 years. There's been over 30 varieties of vegetables cultivars developed at Texas A&M and Texas AgriLife Research, which was formerly Texas Ag Experiment Station. Um, these include some famous things, the mild jalapeno, which really, really made an impact on things like bacani sauce. Um, the 1015 onion, which has had an a impact on the state of Texas of about half a billion dollars, the 1015 and its relatives. Uh, the beta sweet carrot and the Chico tomato, which a lot of people forget originated in Texas and at one point was the single most important processing tomato in the world, particularly in the warm regions of the world. And then the Perlita cantaloupe, which was the number one variety of melon in Texas back when we had 25,000 acres of melon production. That's changed, unfortunately, but the importance of these things cannot be stressed enough. Largely, these were all open-pollinated open cultivars, and yet they had a dramatic impact on the industry and were used in breeding programs in other places. And then, of course, uh, with the advent of Dr. Pike's uh, Vegetable Improvement Center, we focused more on health benefits. And when talking to Dr. Pike, he told me two things after he retired he was most proud of. One was this changing the conversation to 
the importance of the nutrition in plant breeding and health benefits and also training graduate students. This is just an example of how much of an icon that sweet onion is in Texas and the 1015 of course uh, now we have the legend and the honey sweet were all, all derivatives of that. And here's a little tribute to Dr. Pike. Um, unfortunately we don't get to talk to him anymore but uh, he, uh, uh, I have very fond memories of his uh, influence on us as plant breeders but also as responsible uh, uh, contributors to the agricultural system in Texas and throughout the United States and in fact globally. He had a large influence in South America on the onion industry, onion industry as well. And as I mentioned on the bottom there, he was really most proud of the fact that he was able to train other plant breeders and there are a lot of his students in the industry in vegetable breeding and, and in many different crops. In fact, there's several of them here today. This was the last, uh, the last thing that he released uh, that had a, a, a large, uh, in, in the carrot realm that had a large impact and largely because of its very high nutritional value. It did not catch on as much because of its appearance, sadly enough, but its nutritional value in beta carotene and in anthocyanin was much greater than a typical orange carrot, and it has, been, it has found a home in the juice industry. So what are we doing at the VFIC and the Department of Horticulture at Texas A&M and in collaboration with our colleagues uh, off campus? Uh, we're looking for elevated levels of some of the compounds that Dr. Irwin mentioned in these crops, some of them everybody's familiar with, vitamin C, carotenoids. We're also doing a lot of traditional plant breeding. So this is an area that has not been as exploited as much, so we have to set the groundwork. Uh, we have to do a lot of the basic germplasm evaluation to determine what, what lines carry these attributes that we want to use. And then I'll talk a little bit about molecular marker development where we're trying to go now and in the future to enhance the ability for marker assisted selection. Many of the assays for these compounds, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Goldman and Dr. Patil can attest, or Dr. Yu, are very tedious, time consuming, sometimes expensive. So if we can have molecular markers linked to some of these uh, key genes or, or major QTL, it would be very, very handy. So to begin with, the current priorities of our program are cultivar development and, and basic research. Now, uh, a lot of the work we do relates to stress resistance. I won't talk as much about that, but it definitely impacts the, the, the level of some of these phytochemicals, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way. This, incidentally, is a, uh, a picture of Dr. Pike's nephew, who was my PhD student. I have to say probably one of my best PhD students ever. He's now working as an onion breeder in the private industry, but he, car he carried on the tra tradition, and he's holding up some of the, the legend onion, which was the last variety Dr. Pike released, which is now one of the top varieties and certainly has been used in the breeding programs of a lot of companies. And then in basic research, I'll talk a little bit about genetic studies, uh, our attempts at genome mapping, and, some, and uh, mentioned that we have done some work in tissue culture and genetic modification. However, there are some uh, restrictions on that uh, set based on, on uh, social aspects that I won't get into. But but uh, nonetheless, it is possible and it is being done enhancing the nutritional value through GMOs. So the crops of interest that I'll talk about, uh, largely most of my work has been done in peppers and melons and tomatoes. Uh, I'll mention a little bit of work that we're continuing on onions that we hope to expand with the hiring of a new breeder at the Avaldi Center. And I will also uh, uh, go into detail on some of the specific Im uh, improvements and achievements we've made. Um, why are some of these crops, uh, in, in, in this instance, uh, pepper known to be good? And then for many thousands of years in the, in the Americas where this, this crop originated, it was known to be very healthy. Well, to start with, it's very high in fiber, which we know is important for the diet. You can see right here, in fact, it's high enough where you have to be a little bit careful uh, with, with peppers, particularly at the red stage. They're extraordinarily high in fiber. Nonetheless, that means a small amount in the diet has the effect of... Uh, of uh, enhancing you know, colon health, maybe reducing uh, the, the risk of colon cancer. The other thing that's interesting about peppers and some of these other solanaceous crops is the genetic diversity is, is tremendous. So we only have six species that we actually consume of the 23 or 20 to 25 uh, species that exist, but within just those six species, there's tremendous genetic diversity that has not been exploited by any means because of the fact that there's been a, a focus mostly on capsicum annuum, the bell pepper. So what we decided to do when we, we identified the potential in peppers to have nutraceuticals, 
high levels of, of known uh, compounds like ascorbic acid is to screen the germplasm. So we did indeed do that. We, just, we screened amongst four of the cultivated species about a thousand di diverse pepper lines. And when I say we, I literally mean with the help of Dr. Yu, Dr. Patil, uh, Dr. Lescovar, um, Dr. Jafan in multi-locations. And we identified several lines that were outstanding in some of these compounds and that had reasonable quality. They weren't, they weren't completely uh, uh, removed from cultivated forms. And indeed, some of them were cultivars. And we created about 90 new families to study uh, the possibility of enhancing our cultivated forms. Now, bell pepper itself and jalapeno pepper, the two most popular peppers in the United States, are lower in many of these compounds. They weren't selected necessarily for higher levels. Um, they both have a, a reasonably high amount of, of vitamin C, but beyond that, we wanted to study some, uh, some of the phenolic compounds, in particular flavonoids. And so we identified this CA377, extraordinarily high in flavonoids, up to 700 micrograms per, per gram, which is as much or more even than an onion, and more than an apple. Um, however, it was a little pepper. It didn't much, have much flavor. So we decided to look. I had a student uh, create some families to try to look at the inheritance and perhaps develop some molecular markers associated with high flavonoids. Um, flavonoids, as you know, are implicated in, in potentially reducing certain kinds of cancer, like colon cancer, and also heart health in protecting your cholesterol. So we did some basic genetic studies. And uh, we, we found out that, indeed, uh, the, the, the heritability appeared in the F1 to be fairly low. I mean, there was, it was not a dominant effect at all. And we, we decided to screen the F2 population, which we, after phenotyping for every individual plant, uh, and create a, a genetic linkage map. Well, that didn't turn out to be as easy as we thought. Despite the fact, this is just a, an example of some of the some of the rapid markers we used. After four years of effort, my student managed to find one marker actually associated with, to a small extent, with luteolin. But what we did find also when measuring vitamin C is we found transgressive segregation for vitamin C uh, and for flavonoids. So we found a few individual progeny that were superior to either of the parents. What we, what we also found, which I don't necessarily believe, and I think this is due to a heterosis effect, is high broad sense heritabilities. Now, this usually gives you an idea of how much of it is, is due to genetics and not environment. But in this case, I think it's due probably to genetics, but largely to heterosis, which confounds a lot of these, of these heritability estimates. Uh, we know in peppers, unlike in tomatoes and other solanaceous crops, there's tremendous heterosis. Um, and, and it's a great thing for a hybrid breeding, and a lot of the cultivars are now hybrids. So heterosis is a wonderful thing, but it it does confound some of these type of basic studies. So when looking at this, we thought, oh, great, this will be so easy to introduce this trait of very high flavonoids, which predominantly are quercetin and luteolin, although there are some, some amounts of myrcetin that Dr. Patil has discovered, which has its other uh, potential health benefits. Um, all of the, unfortunately, all of the individuals with higher levels of these compounds were, were smaller fruited like the original source. There was a, a skewing of this of this distribution. So we, there was a distribution to make it obvious it's a quantitative trait, but it was skewed towards smaller fruit sizes. As I mentioned, after four years of effort and a lot of screening of roughly almost 900 or more uh, primers, uh, Justin was only able to identify one uh, rapid marker associated with luteolin around 5% effect. Well, this is a compound that, that could be slightly sensitive to the environment, all of these compounds. So the utility of that for marker assist selection, you know, I'll leave it up to, to people to decide that, but it was, uh, it was a little bit disappointing. But what, we, uh, what was more disappointing as a breeder was this association with smaller fruit, because the ideal uh, intent we have is to introduce this in things that people are consuming, which in this country is largely bell peppers, to some extent jalapeno peppers, and a rising amount of the New Mexico uh, uh, hatch type chili or Anaheim chili. Um, incidentally, of those three, only the Anaheim chili has slightly naturally higher levels of these compounds. So uh, what we did find, though, is no negative association between size and ascorbic acid. So we're able to have bell peppers that do have elevated levels of ascorbic acid, in fact, tremendously high levels compared even to an orange. So this is about the maximum we were able to achieve and elevate the, flav the flavonoids. So the bell pepper parent had a flavonoid levels of about 10 micrograms per gram, 
very small. This uh, multiple generations of back crossing and selection, we, we are able to raise it to about 100, still uh, less than 20% of the, of the donor parent. And this is, uh, I, I truly believe, is because of the association with, with fruit size. The larger the fruit, this is 120 gram fruit. Bell peppers, as you know, these days are frequently well over 200 grams, 300 grams. So if that's the, what the market demands, we are limited here so far. With ascorbic acid, as I mentioned, we, we didn't find this association. Unfortunately, we also found no markers associated with ascorbic acid. I think that's largely because it is so sensitive to the environment. Ascorbic acid, uh, uh, I don't have a table here, but we have done quite a bit of work with Dr. Lescovar and in different locations and in different years and at different uh, times in the same cropping season, the ascorbic acid uh, can vary by 300% in the same plant much less the same cultivar. So it's going to be very difficult to map, I think, uh, other than the genes in the synthesis pathway, uh, to map QTL that affect the ultimate concentration of ascorbic acid. It's, that being said, it's fairly easy to measure ascorbic acid compared to some other compounds. Um, so I think uh, it may be marker assist selection won't be as, as, as simple in that particular trait in peppers, at least. This just gives you an example of the effect of, uh, of environment. And in this case, in nearly every case, and this is a rare thing that I would, that I would say this, West Laco, Texas produces higher levels of ascorbic acid than Uvalde, Texas. In most other attributes we measure, Uvalde was a better climate for producing quality, for sugars, for aromatics, for carotenoids. But for ascorbic acid, so this is a stress-related compound, right? And it's a pretty stressful environment down there. It's hot. There's, you know, there's a lot of wind stress, you know, there's a lot of salt stress. So that might, might explain some of it. The reason I put this slide is just to show the amount of, of, uh, of screening that Justin did. He managed to not just do his, his, his mapping work, he managed also to screen in three environments a lot of different germplasm for us and get a, gather a lot of data that was actually quite useful because some of these are F1 hybrids and ultimately are finished products. So if we wanted to work with a, a company who's interested, uh, in having a finished product that has a high level of these compounds, it would be useful. And you can, you can see uh, down there where it says C1 and C2, if you can see that, those are cayenne-type peppers that we developed, um, and purely by serendipity. We were not screening the original parents. These hybrids produced uh, much higher levels of ascorbic acid than the Messia, which is the standard cultivar of the industry, which is an excellent cultivar, but it was not selected for nutritional value at all. So that is one potential thing that we can uh, promote these, these new experimental cayenne peppers. Now, cayenne peppers largely do get processed. So unfortunately, most of the vitamin C will be degraded in the process. But uh, for the small amount of the market where it's eaten fresh, it would have an application. And those are things that we have to consider also as breeders and as vegetable uh, research scientists is what, as, as Dr. Goldman stressed, what are we going to do with the vegetable. Are we going to cook it, in which case we're going to remove a lot of these important compounds or damage them, or are we going to eat it fresh? So maybe the old, the old uh, lore or adage about eating your vegetables and fruits fresh, there was something to that. Um, that being said, some compounds, as we know, carotenoids sometimes can be less available when they're, when they're eaten in fresh produce. So in the case of uh, those, it may be better to slightly cook them. And this is just an example of what I was talking about, uh, uh, flavonoids and uh, heterosis. These are, once again, all some experimental hybrids. And you can see uh, some, some substantial levels of uh, flavonoid, once again, predominantly in the C types, the cayenne type pepper. So this is germplasm that is naturally uh, higher in these compounds. And we found the same thing with the ancho pepper, which is popular in Mexico. Just, it hasn't been selected for these attributes, obviously. But they're playing a role in the plant. These, these, these antioxidants have roles in the plant to protect the plant from stresses, mostly abiotic stresses. So it's likely that those types of peppers were selected in stressful environments for, for many generations. Um, unfortunately, the J represent jalapeno tends to be extremely low in most of these compounds. It's also the most important hot pepper that we consume. So that's, there's a lot of work we have to do there. Um, this is, the, the, this is the, the table I wanted to demonstrate what I said, there's a lot of heterosis in peppers we know for fruit size, for maturity, for uh, yield, for other attributes that are very important to us. 
Um, so we wondered if there was heterosis for any of these phytochemical attributes. And indeed, the underlined uh, values there represent extreme heterosis, either positive or negative. Sometimes it, the ones in the top, in the middle for capsaicin, very negative on those uh, paprikas. In the total flavonoids, you can see the fifth from the top there, uh, extremely positive for this type of serrano pepper. So it's much better than either parent. Uh, this, I believe, our mid-parent, but this is better than either parent, this, this level. So that, that's exciting for uh, breeders in the private industry because everything now in this crop is an F1 hybrid for the most part in the United States and in, 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 in many of the high-intensity production systems. There are parts of the world where open pollinated is still very important and releasing germplasm for those, uh, those production systems is, is, is great because it's uh, inbred lines, basically. They're, they're true to type from seed, uh, much like tomatoes, they'll tolerate inbreeding. But for a hybrid system, hybrid pepper systems, they would love to see heterosis for, for something you know, that they can then market. And you can see, and capsaicin is a thing that causes pungency. A lot of people may not tolerate that in much. In many countries, high capsaicin is very important. I just returned on a trip from, from Yucatan in Mexico, and you want to talk about high capsaicin. The, these people cannot get it hot enough, and they told me their priority, number one, for their pepper breeding program is elevated capsaicin. Now, capsaicin is known to have health benefits. It's being studied for uh, anti-inflammatory, for wound healing, for potential anti-cancer. So it's probably a good thing in your diet, but there are limitations. Some people don't tolerate it. It can cause acid reflux. So, uh, but from the breeding standpoint, and for certain areas where it's a priority, if you can get that much heterosis for that compound, great, because that's something they already know they need, or that the, that the market demands. As a matter of fact, ironically, there is a trend towards developing hotter jalapenos even in the U.S. market. So apparently Americans have become more tolerant or, of capsaicin in their diet and are wanting hotter things. And so the, the priority in most breeding programs these days on hot peppers is hotter. This is an example of a breeding line that came out of Justin's research. So even if we're doing some fundamental basic research, I'm always thinking as a breeder, and, and all of you that are going to be breeders should always be thinking, you know, well, if, if it fails or it's not as successful as we want, can we make, you know, something out of it? Can we find something? And here we found a breeding line that was elevated not just in flavonoids, but also in vitamin C. Um, and we're using that, you know, for our breeding program to simultaneously enhance this in some, hopefully in some, in some larger fruited types. We also found this, and this was once again by serendipity. This was a source of phytophthora resistance that we used, uh, which is a, is a chronic disease on peppers worldwide. It was brought from, by a, by a veteran in World War II. He brought it back from the New Guinea campaign and he saved it in his yard for years in California, and he gave it to my predecessor, Dr. Villalone. And when he screened it, he found it was quite resistant. Well, we screened it and found it was also an excellent source of flavonoids, particularly it was high in luteolin. And as a result, the materials we developed out of it for phytophthora resistance, we went back, we screened them, we found out, oh, they're, they're also much higher uh, than the parent material in, in, in luteolin, which is, a, which is a flavonoid that's been implicated in reduced incidence of some of the, of the enzymes that lead to breast cancer and other types of cancer. So uh, it's, uh, it's useful to have in the germplasm and, and, and as I mentioned, somewhat serendipitous that this, this occurred, but uh, we were more interested in the phytophthora resistance, but now we have some, some lines that are very high in this compound compared to the original parents. Now moving into the other main uh, crop that I work on, We've done a lot of screening in melons because Texas Citrus has a strong melon industry. Um, and quality was quality and disease were the primary issues. So we developed a, a lot of families, and we started with the help of Dr. Yu and Dr. Patil. And, and, and this goes back to when I was a PhD student, PhD student with Dr. Pike to screen these material for a lot of different attributes, not the least of which was phytochemical content. And so along with my postdoc, Dr. Park, who unfortunately uh, passed away last year, so it, it, uh, it's a little sad when I look back at this data and I think about how much work that he in particular put into this. We, uh, we managed to develop some interesting populations and we had some students, once again, looking for markers associated. And we occasionally would find some markers that looked really good in the parents and they looked really good in our bulks for uh, polymorphisms. Unfortunately, not a single one of these after several years of, 
of efforts uh, actually did turn out to be associated with the QTL for high beta carotene. Now, there's actually two major genes that, that contribute to high beta carotene. So, you know, we really were scratching our heads thinking, well, what, why are we having this confounding day? So this is an area where we need to, to, to expand with a, with a better marker system probably, uh, uh, maybe to develop some SNP markers uh, with a future project for students. I don't think it should be as difficult as it turned out to be, but sometimes uh, that's what happens. However, we were a little disappointed about those results, though we did have a, a master's student finish up. Uh, what did come out of that, once again, was useful germplasm. And it resulted in release of a, of a new melon cultivar with a very high beta carotene and a very nice uh, attributes and also very high sugars. So sugars are pretty easy to measure as a, as a plant breeder. They're, they're one of the easiest things. So I, I, don't, I don't completely understand how any melon is released with low sugars, but it, it does occur. Nonetheless, uh, we also, uh, with uh, Dr. Yu's help, were able to select a high beta carotene inbred. And this is mostly being used in hybrids because, again, the melon industry has transitioned into F1 hybrids. But it's highly heritable, so that's a good attribute of this trait. Uh, the sugars and, and particularly the beta carotene is highly heritable in the F1 hybrids. So this is just a little, another little chart showing in comparison to some popular hybrids and the donor. The donor of this, these traits, both high sugars and high beta carotene, is Tam Uvalde. Going back all the way to the 1960s, uh, the melon breeding program at Wessico developed this material for high quality, and it's still useful in breeding programs today. In fact, I have never met a melon breeder in the industry that has not used this line in their breeding program. So that's the type of impact that, uh, you know, that, that, a dedicated plant breeder can have. He may not see it at the time. When he released this variety, the industry didn't really like it because they thought it was a little bit on the small side. But it's, it's been great uh, for many programs to enhance the quality of their, of their uh, germplasm. So along with Dr. Park, we decided to try to map some of these traits in melon in a different family. So we switched to a high and low vitamin C family, uh, the Deltex being high, the TGR being low. We did the same process and we screened with random markers, uh, an F2 family, and we assembled uh, a linkage, uh, a set of linkage groups uh, that was equivalent to the 12 chromosomes in melon. Um, this is the type of genetic diversity you see in melons, much like peppers. Uh, there's a lot of genetic diversity. It's a small genome, but it doesn't intercross with any of the other species, but yet there's still a tremendous amount of genetic diversity. So I guess it has, uh, you know, less junk DNA and more DNA that actually contributes genes that that have a lot of impact on quality and appearance and, and, and uh, fruit shape and size. So what we did, what we did find, and this is a, a lot of hard work by Dr. Park. I mean, I provided a lot of the phenotypic data. He did most of the linkage analysis, and we collaborated on this. We did find on chromosome 5T there, the underlying marker 3.7, this highly associated with the QTL for vitamin C. So that was the good thing. We also found on chromosome 6, there's an underlying marker um, on chromosome 9. Okay, this is just half of the map. On chromosome 9, there's several markers we found in a cluster linked to high sucrose. Now, as I mentioned, that's fairly easy to phenotype, so that may be less useful, but the, the vitamin C marker is, is useful. However, what we did find is this marker works best when we're using the same high vitamin C parent. We moved it to different families that were unrelated. It was not effective. So what we need to do is develop more robust markers once again. Um, we do have a lot of families with that particular high vitamin C parent. And then moving into tomato breeding, uh, this has really uh, changed dramatically because Texas used to be the third biggest producer of, of tomatoes in the United States. It's not in the top 10 anymore, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's really... It's a competitive thing. It's all economics. We can grow a lot of tomatoes here. We can grow good tomatoes, high in lycopene. But, you know, right to our south is one of the world's largest producers of export tomatoes. And so, you know, the competition is, is difficult. Uh, Dr. Leeper uh, did release varieties that were very important to the processing industry. Um, and currently, we've moved more into the fresh market industry because, once again, we want people to eat uh, fresh produce. This is... Uh, this is a graph with the help of Dr. Patil that demonstrates the progress we've made in lycopene selection. Now, we know there's a major gene uh, called old gold corolla that enhances the amount of lycopene up to 50% greater than if you don't have it. But there's also underlying QTL that also contribute 
to enhance lycopene levels. And so uh, probably the standard of the industry lately has been the Tasty Lee tomato released by the University of Florida um, by Dr. Jay Scott. And it's an excellent tomato. The flavor is good and it has high lycopene. So we were glad to see that ours is competitive. Our uh, TAM, the, the rest of it's gone there, uh, will be called Hot Ties. We just released it, is even higher in lycopene. Um, the jury is out about flavor. Everybody has a, a little bit different idea of flavor. Ours is higher in acidity, so for people that like that, they may favor it. Theirs is a little bit lower in acidity. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we, uh, we are proud that we were able to achieve this in a period of about 10 years uh, to select this very high level of lycopene in a background that's acceptable to growers in the large tomato that is resistant to virus, heat stress, other things that, that are necessary in Texas. So right now, uh, there's a lot of demand from the from the small growers and also from the extension people uh, in nurseries to get this tomato because they really need high temperature set tomatoes in Texas. We have a uniquely hot climate uh, and in the tropics uh, the same thing. You have to have high temperature set tomatoes. Much of the germplasm developed in California and other locations doesn't have uh, this attribute. This is just a picture comparing it to commercial varieties that are very good commercial varieties for size, for yield. Um, the other attribute attribute to mention is it it's extraordinarily early and in the case of Texas that's to escape the heat not to escape the cold we need to get the tomatoes ripened before it when it gets above 90 degrees lycopene synthesis and in overall quality is uh, rapidly degrading so we need to get the tomatoes out of the field in most parts of Texas with the exception of maybe the high plains before it gets too hot this is, I mentioned, just some of the attributes with the help of our student and Dr. Patil, our PhD student, measuring uh, and, and demonstrating that it indeed has quite a bit more acidity and sugars than some of the other cultivars, um, which uh, to me are a little bit flat tasting, but it really depends on what you, what you uh, uh, consider to be uh, the most important attributes of a tomato. Uh, in the taste panel, our, our cultivar came in second, so it's not bad. Actually, I think it was com the number one was the greenhouse tomato, so that it's kind of comparing apples and oranges. But nonetheless, I think uh, I think people will accept that. The other success we've had was working with the processing industry that still remains, and this is strictly the canned diced tomatoes, and they're looking for very basic uh, attributes, uh, lycopene being the one associated with health. They want higher lycopene, and that's a good thing. So we're enhancing that as we go. They're also interested in high acidity. These are for processing. And that's fairly easy to measure, too. Um, you know, it has to have a high yield. It has to be resistant to viruses, absolutely, fusarium, and some other diseases. And so this is a, a case where if you're a plant breeder, you can interact very closely with industry. And it's very satisfying because they don't, you know, they don't pull any punches. They tell you exactly what's good and what's bad and what they need. And they don't shower you with unnecessary praise. And, but then when they get something they like, then they're, then they're your friend for life. And those are, those are the good types of friends to have because it's ba based on mutual respect. Now, I'm, I'm not doing the type of onion breeding that Dr. Goldman mentioned because we don't have uh, right now the funding, the capacity, but we're in a maintenance mode, so to speak. So we still work with Dr. Lescovar and Dr. Jafan, and we screen onion germplasm. These are the primary uh, uh, priorities, and of course, quality comes from all of these. This disease is the epicenter is Texas. If you have susceptibility to this disease, you do not have quality. Your bulb is small. You will not have as much of the phytochemicals. The plant is not healthy. It's dying. So Dr. Pike was one of the first to really standardize pink root resistance in short day onions. And, and his germplasm has been used uh, extensively for that. As a matter of fact, this one listed as resistant is going to be the new cultivar that will be released. Um, now, it is an open pollinated onion, so it will probably also be adopted uh, as a breeding parent for companies, but it is a very, very pink root resistant white onion that also is, I think I have a chart in a minute, also is very, um, very high, uh, low in pyruvate. So this is a case where you, we've lowered these health benefiting compounds, but to such low levels, it's the one there that says uh, 2.4. Um, to such low levels, that's substantially lower than the original 1015, that people will eat this fresh. I mean, some people already eat fresh onions, you know, in parts of the world. And in, in South Texas, and in, in Mexican cuisine, it's common to eat hot fresh onions. So this will allow people to eat more 
of, of fresh onions because they're sweet. They don't burn them as much and get some of the health benefits. Uh, it's also, incidentally, a, a, a very high-yielding and well-adapted onion. So we, we wouldn't release it solely because... Uh, and I would not encourage anyone to release something as a cultivar solely because it has a high level of a health benefiting compound if it is not adapted, if it does not yield. Because farmers will say, that's nice, you know, and then they'll grow another cultivar. So ultimately, we have to consider those attributes. How does it handle? What's its shelf life? It has a good shelf life. Things like that. Now, Dr. Yu did a lot of analysis for Dr. Pike, and he continues some of this for myself. And what he determined is that, and not surprising, as Dr. Goldman mentioned, Red onions really have the most overall health benefits. They have the pungent compounds. They have anthocyanins, which we all know uh, implicated in grapes and blueberries. And they have uh, flavonoids, high. But what Dr. Yu was trying to demonstrate is that there was progress in the breeding program for high levels of flavonoids in the yellow onions. And you can see D17 there as an example. It's as high statistically as the red onions in a yellow onion, which is the most popular type, about 90% of Texas onions and short day sweet onions or yellow onions. Uh, D40 also looks, uh, looks very good. This antioxidant uh, activity is a large component of it is the, uh, is the flavonoids. And incidentally, flavonoids are not associated uh, with pungency. So you can have a lower pungency and elevated levels of flavonoids. The other thing I would mention is that as a breeder, and all of you future breeders here, replicate your work in multiple environments because of the fact that even in a state like tech the one state like texas we have a lot of different environments you can move a few hundred miles from uvalde to wesico and see as i mentioned with the peppers dramatic differences on the same uniform germplasm or cultivars or hybrids so you need to know how that will impact your beneficial phytochemicals and it's a learning lesson we we were we were very uh i guess overly optimistic about vitamin c and now we've nearly given up on the idea of developing robust markers for this trait because it is so hard to measure consistently. It varies so much. From the beginning of the day, I have a colleague that published a paper. From the beginning of the day until 3 p.m. in the afternoon, there was a 50% decrease in melons on the same plant of vitamin C. So when did you sample your melons and then you take, it to the, you, you take your DNA and go to the lab and you think you've got a high vitamin C or you know the exact level? the same plant was producing a 50% difference later in the day. So what if two different people harvest at different times? So this is a thing that you really need to consider when phenotyping, you know, how accurate is your data? And you only learn that when you look at multiple environments. And then, of course, fertilizers. There's no uh, substitute for good fertility for most of these compounds. When the plants are stressed, they do not develop with the exception of a few stress-related compounds, they don't develop as good overall quality and nutritional value. Uh, Dr. Jafan, my colleague, has looked at some of our germplasm and found that even though we've enhanced it genetically, he can enhance it another 10 or 20 percent just by potassium uh, fer fertility and increase not just the, the level of beta carotene significant, but the sugar, because if you ask the average consumer, they don't want a melon if it's not sweet, even if it's high in beta carotene. Of course, they would like beta carotene, but they want it to be sweet too. And, and these type of sugars are, are good for your health. It, it's not like eating just you know, Twinkies, you know, no offense to Twinkies, but it, it, it's a good type of sugar. Um, so ultimately, what comes out of this and what probably I can be somewhat proud of and, and, and Dr. I, can be, I can think about Dr. Pike and his impacts is, is cultivars that actually do deliver uh, better nutrients and that people want to eat. Because as Dr. Goldman stressed, if people can't tolerate eating something, it doesn't matter how healthy it is, they're going to they're gonna resort to a supplement. And do we really want everything just to be, become a supplement? And so these are just a few examples of some of the things that came out of our program that are higher in nutrients. Uh, a mild habanero, we reduced the capsaicin, so once again people could tolerate it, increase the beta carotene. Now I told the people in Mexico and they were about to run me out of the place, but they really want high capsaicin. So we released some high capsaicin habaneros, and as a matter of fact, the one on the right is very successful uh, actually in Mexico, but we're trying to encourage people to grow it here because this is a growing market for not just hot sauce, but anybody else have an idea? The military, security, uh, they're using this as a source of, of, of the pungent compound for non-lethal 
crowd control, weapons, you name it. So I was wondering why they were so fascinated in Mexico. They had a big grant to work on high capsaicin. It's their military wants to use it. Maybe, maybe against the bad guys. I don't know who, but you know, you don't want to get this in your eye for sure. But nonetheless, uh, there's also heterosis for this trait. So we found both of these hybrids were hotter than either of the parents. And so that was a, a good thing. I mean, it, you know, it depends on your point of view from a culinary perspective. But for other uses, it's a good thing. There's a lot of people working on capsaicin as a, as an ant, as a repellent for pests, for rats that chew on cables, for termites, for a lot of things. So it has a lot of industrial applications. Now, uh, once again, this was serendipity. We developed this melon largely for disease resistance and beta carotene. And my colleague uh, at the USDA, Dr. Lester, was very interested in superoxide dismutase. There's interest in this. It's a very powerful antioxidant, and it may be linked to anti-aging to reduce uh, oxidative stress to your skin in particular. I know it's used in beauty products now. And we found that this was one of the highest of all the melons he measured. This was the highest in superoxide dismutase. So now we just released this. I was able to tack that on and reference his publication. Hey, this not only you know, it's resistant to disease, it tastes good. It has S high SOD, which is right now kind of a, uh, an, in, you know, an interesting marketing component, but no doubt about it, it's, uh, it's a positive. And these are just some of the other cultivars that have come out of the program um, that have applications because growers thought that they were useful for whatever reason. And when we went back and screened them, each one of these things had elevated levels compared to their Czech cultivar. Beta carotene in the melon and the pepper, in the habanero and then zeaxanthin in the jalapeno and then in the violone pepper which is the anaheim type high levels of flavonoids compared to a bell pepper about 80 to 90 parts per million as opposed to about 10. so that's an example now i promised my good friend bb singh that i would not take all the credit at the vegetable improvement center for improving uh, the nutritional value this is a man that cares deeply about improving the nutritional status of people particularly in developing countries by giving them a means to do that. And his, uh, you know, as most breeders, he's very concerned about yield. But what he found out is also he can select for high antioxidant compounds in his cow peas, which are a vegetable and a pulse and a forage and a lot of things to a lot of different people. And they're easy to produce. They have a short cycle. And so he found some lines extremely high in antioxidants. And this is really important in developing countries where they're going to eat this crop because it tolerates their harsh conditions and they may be lacking some of these key compounds. Maybe they don't have fresh vegetables that we eat, the melons, the carrots, the things. But maybe they can get these in the cow peas. And he even found, you know, nature was kind enough to color code them. So some of the ones that, that have a, a, a brownish color had higher levels of antioxidants than the ones that we eat in this country, the white-colored black-eyed peas. So this also is very informative to the American public that maybe we can just accept the way something looks if it tastes about the same because we can get more health benefits. And this type of, uh, this is once again, this is a type of uh, beneficial discovery you can make in a breeding program without in the very beginning setting out to accomplish this. And I'll just end with this in, 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 in behalf of Bibi and say that this is something that, you know, the poor man may be considered as a meat, a source of protein, but also antioxidants and maybe for the rich man, you can consider it for the antioxidants. Thank you, Dr. Crosby, for your presentation. If anyone in the audience has a question, we have a microphone on either side of the room. Uh, our volunteer will come up to you uh, with the microphone. Uh, you can ask her questions. We also have a, a live webinar going on. And uh, those in the webinar can ask questions through the chat box. To start off our question and answer session, we will be starting with a question from the webinar. So we have uh, Alexander Susko from Minnesota. Uh, his question for you, Dr. Crosby, is, would you expect heterosis for phytochemical content in crosses between different pepper types, that is, serrano peppers and cayenne peppers? Um, have you been able to delineate heterotic groups in capsicum for these traits? Well, the answer to the first question is absolutely. We've seen that. And the answer to the second question is we're working on it. But now that there's a, there's a complete pepper genome map, I think it opens up the possibility of doing a lot more valuable mapping, not the type of random mapping I've been doing in the past. We, we can actually, uh, you know, place important uh, uh, QTL 
related to these traits where they belong. Anyone else have a question? My question is about the anthocyaninless peppers I've been reading about. There's a kind called Aristotle that's pretty popular. I was wondering what the um, why that variety, why the aspect of being anthocyaninless was considered a favorable property. Um, that's strictly cosmetic and largely in bell and jalapeno pepper. Um, there are some higher anthocyanin peppers that are, would have some nutritional benefits, but they're not uh, the color is not considered, it's, it's purely cosmetic. It doesn't have any impact on flavor or anything else. It's actually good for stress tolerance. It reduces sunburn to the fruit, but it's not, it's not accepted in the marketplace. Other than sunburn, what is the color property that is affected? Uh, range from violet to dark purple, almost a muddy purple color. Um, it, the the anthocyanin levels are strictly in the epidermis. The concentration, so it, it can it couldn't compete with a carrot, the maroon carrot or a blueberry, you know. So I would I would just say, you know, if you if you're interested in anthocyanin, maybe seek out those crops more than uh, peppers, unless you're an ornamental breeder. The ornamental breeders use that trait a lot. Can I? So, Dr. Bowman. Kevin, could you comment on the nutritional significance and properties of the? of that dried pepper. I'm thinking of like the pasilla type pepper where they, yeah. they dry it out like a raisin. Yeah, those uh, are going to have a lot of carotenoids because the carotenoids, as long as they're protected from UV light and so you store them in the dark, you know, they'll deliver a lot of carotenoids, especially if you're probably going to cook with them even better. Maybe add some oil, put it in your enchilada sauce with some cheese, you know, and there you go. You so that would be for you. much significantly improved over a fresh pepper. Well, it's about a 10% dry matter in peppers. So when you do that, you'll have a, well, you know, subtracting degradational degradation, you'll have up to a 10, 10 times greater concentration nice. of the carotenoids. Now, the other compounds, the vitamin C will be gone. About over 50% of the flavonoids are lost, but some of them are still there. Mm -hmm. And the capsaicin is extremely durable, so mm -hmm. it will stay there for years. Nice. Hello. Um, you talked a little about uh, tomato breeding and uh, how about how Texas has majority of processing market, but you're developing varieties for the fresh market in Texas. So my question is, is where else can they be grown other than Texas? Uh, well, we have done trials in five regions of the state. We have a trials going on in Amarillo, uh, in Westlaco to the extremes, in East Texas, and multiple trials in, in Central Texas. And we found there's a, there's a big G by E effect on tomatoes. So our best varieties, like the one we released for South Texas, it tends to crack more and, and not yield as good in the high plains for some reason, whereas it's an excellent yielder and it doesn't crack in South Texas. So it gets back to testing in multiple locations. Um, so far, the processing tomatoes are more forgiving of the environment. So the processor we have has done well in all our trials. But on the larger size tomatoes, there's definitely a strong uh, G by E type of interaction. So you, you better test it in multiple locations. Now greenhouse is a whole other item. Some greenhouse growers are, are very interested too. So they're testing some of my germplasm in the greenhouse and I have no clue how it's going to react. So we have a question from the webinar from Kate, Kate Mueller. Uh, have you done any work in tomatoes utilizing other genes like delta, apricot that affect carotenoid levels? Beta, Zeta, Delta carotenoids. We have germplasm breeding lines, but we haven't measured those traits yet because our, our growers were interested in the high lycopene and the red color. But um, if we have time and maybe if I have a student, we could, we could delve into that. We have a student right now looking at volatiles and potential other beneficial phytochemicals that, that are yet unknown in tomatoes, and she's studying that right now, um, and so she'll probably delve into that. Any other questions from the room? If not, there's another question from the webinar. So um, you mentioned that carotenoids require cooking to increase bioactivity. And Dr. Goldman mentioned that uh, theosulfonides are best consumed fresh owing to heat degradation of alienase and uh, thiosulfonate uh, volatility. Have you noticed any pattern regarding the bioactivity of the nut nutricidal 
uh, compounds that require cooking versus fresh consumption. Any difference in the bioactivity? Bioactivity of nutrici nutraceutical compounds that require cooking versus fresh. Well, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I did sleep at that, you know, Holly Express. So I, I can't attest to the, the, the uh, biological activity like in vitro or in human. I, all I can attest to is higher levels. And incidentally, that brings up a good point that Dr. Patil and I were discussing a lot and with this student is the possibility of shifting the production into cyst lycopene in tomatoes. And they've done that in some places, actually. And cyst lycopene is much more available without cooking in your gut. So if we can select germplasm that's higher in the cyst and not the trans, um, ours are typical higher in trans, then they can be more bioavailable without cooking and you, you can mix it with your fresh onions or, uh, you know, for your salsa. Alternatively, you could just cook your tomatoes and put your onions in afterwards without being cooked if you're, if you're concerned with that. But as far as the, the effects in, in vitro or in cell culture, uh, that, that's uh, some collaborations Dr. Patil has with, with medical scientists. Uh, I think there's a lot of positive, uh, you know, results for not just lycopene, but some of these other phenolic compounds. Uh, I think we... Okay. Uh, hi, Kevin. A great, great presentation. Enjoyed it. I'm, I'm not sure I can verbalize my question, but I'm going to take a shot at it. From an evolutionary perspective, why were vegetables selected, the, the tomatoes, etc., selected by mankind to consume? It, it, we, we're, we're talking today about the phytochemicals and flavonoids and the health benefits, but it seems to me from an evolutionary perspective that that would have been a post-childbearing years natural selection process among humans. So did humans select these things simply because they taste good or you know, said another way, why in the world would someone select broccoli uh, to, to consume 100,000 years ago? You have to ask that question in Italy, though I do like broccoli. That's a minor mutation. So a lot of those coal crops and a lot of these things are surprisingly just a few gene mutations cause dramatic change in the expression of stem tissue, floral tissue, fruit tissue. Um, I think I read, and if you can believe it, that after screening a humongous population, the Israelis pinpointed two genes contributing to a huge increase in fruit size in tomato from the progenitors. So those are just mutations. People say, oh, bigger is better, I guess. But I think it's largely carbohydrates, energy, flavor, uh, you know, so hunter-gatherer type of a deal. Why they like berries, they taste good. That would be my guess. I don't think they were thinking about having cancer or anything else. Yeah.